Hello, and welcome back to Architecture Topics. I'm Liam Karen, and today we continue our special series on the New York World Trade Center. In the last episode, we explored the story of the Twin Towers, their design, their construction, and their place in New York life. Today, we turn to the morning of September 11th, 2001, a day that began like any other in Lower Manhattan, but became one of the most devastating days in modern history. This episode will not be about politics or global events. It will be about the site itself, the towers, the surrounding buildings, and why they fell. It is a story of engineering pushed to its limits, of destruction, and of a skyline forever changed. Let's begin. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, the World Trade Center complex was coming to life like it had on thousands of days before. Commuters poured out of the PATH trains into the underground concourse. Newsstands sold coffee and newspapers, while office workers rode the escalators up into the towers and headed for the elevators. On the outside plaza, the sun lit up the striped facades of the towers. Tourists lined up for the observation deck, and high in the North Tower, staff prepared windows on the world for breakfast service. It was a clear blue Tuesday morning, a perfectly normal day in lower Manhattan. But things changed quickly. At 8.46 a.m., a plane hit the North Tower. From the ground, no one understood what had just happened. At first, many thought it was a small aircraft, some kind of accident. After all, planes had struck buildings before in New York's history. In 1945, a B-25 bomber had crashed into the Empire State Building, killing 14 people, but leaving the tower standing. So as smoke poured from the upper floors of the North Tower, people on the street stared upward in disbelief. Office workers inside began evacuating, not in panic, but in confusion. Fire alarms sounded. Some tried to call loved ones. At that time, no one imagined the building itself was in danger of collapse. Then, 17 minutes later, at 9.03 a.m., a second plane appeared in the sky. United Airlines Flight 175. It banked sharply and crashed into the South Tower between the 77th and 85th floors. This time with everyone watching, and not just people in New York, but literally around the world on live TV. The general feeling shifted quickly. This was no accident. In an instant, the South Tower had erupted in fire and debris. A terrifying sight. On the streets below, panic finally began to spread. Crowds ran, Others froze, unable to look away. Sirens filled Lower Manhattan as fire trucks and ambulances converged on the scene. Inside the towers, chaos began to take over. Those below the impact zones continued to evacuate, stairwell by stairwell. Some were ordered to stay at their desks, told the buildings were secure. But luckily, most ignored those announcements and kept walking down. But above the impact zones, thousands were trapped. Stairwells were severed, elevators destroyed, and smoke filled the hallways. From the ground, people began to see figures at the windows, but the tower's windows didn't open. So people smashed them with chairs or desks, desperate to breathe. They waved shirts or papers through the openings, trying to signal for help. Some tried to go up, climbing flight after flight in the hope of reaching the roof, only to find the roof doors were locked. But even if they hadn't been, helicopter rescues would have been impossible. The smoke, the flames, and the violent updrafts of heat made it too dangerous for any pilot to attempt a landing. So that hope, like so many others that morning, quickly faded. News anchors, still speaking of a possible accident just minutes before, now struggled for words. The Twin Towers stood burning on live television around the world, while firefighters were climbing stairwells trying to reach the offices where workers were still trapped inside. And yet, almost no one imagined the towers themselves might fall. 
Then, with all cameras pointing at the towers, people started noticing something. At first, they couldn't quite tell what they were witnessing. Debris falling? But no. One by one, people began to jump. The heat and the smoke were unbearable. The stairwells impassable. For those trapped above the impact zones, there was no way out. So at some point, they decided to take the only way out of the hell they were trapped in. Witnesses below saw them falling against the endless vertical stripes of the facade. It was a sight so shocking that news cameras often turned away. But for those on the streets of Lower Manhattan, it was inescapable. A terrible reminder that rescue would not come in time. On the ground, firefighters kept going in. Thousands of people were already out, but thousands were still inside, making their way down stairwells step by step as Adios crackled with incomplete information. No one had the full picture. At this point, the fires had been raging for over an hour. Black smoke poured into the blue sky, visible from miles away. Helicopters circled at a distance, reporting what they could see, but powerless to do anything more. And remember from the first episode of this series, the facades of the Twin Towers were structural. Those two massive holes torn into their sides weren't just scars on the surface. The towers had suffered severe structural damage. Then, at 9.59 a.m., something happened that almost no one had thought possible. Something that no one could believe was actually happening. The South Tower began to fall. Suddenly, the top floors started falling down, crashing down into the levels below. The damaged structure could not resist the weight. Each floor slammed into the next, and the collapse cascaded downward. In less than 12 seconds, 110 stories collapsed into a rising cloud of dust and debris. People screamed, ran, some froze in place as the streets of Lower Manhattan disappeared in smoke. When the dust began to settle, the South Tower was gone. People staggered through streets turned to night, covered in ash. Survivors ran north, across bridges, anywhere away from the cloud that had swallowed Lower Manhattan. And yet, even then, many still believed the North Tower would stand. After all, it had taken the first hit, and it was still standing. And it did so for nearly another half an hour. But then, at 10.28 a.m., the scene that nobody wanted to relive happened again. The North Tower collapsed. The great antenna tilted, the upper floors gave way, and in a matter of seconds, the building disintegrated floor by floor, vanishing into the same roiling cloud of smoke and dust. The Twin Towers, symbols of New York for three decades, were gone. And the destruction did not end there. Around them, much of the World Trade Center complex was destroyed. The Marriott Hotel at the base of the towers was crushed. World Trade Center buildings five and six were left in ruins. And later that afternoon, at 5.20 p.m., Building 7, a 47-story office tower just north of the site, also collapsed after burning for hours. What remained at day's end was devastation. A gaping wound of rubble, fire, and dust, where once the world's tallest towers had stood. Now let's try to understand why the towers fell. When the planes struck, they caused catastrophic damage right away. The impacts tore through the perimeter columns, advanced through the open floors, and severed core supports. But the towers were built with redundancy. They could survive losing many columns and still stand. And for a while, they did. The real danger came from the fires. In a normal high-rise fire, the flames might be limited to one or two floors, giving sprinklers and firefighters a chance to contain it. But here, thousands of gallons of jet fuel acted like an accelerant, igniting paper, furniture, 
and carpet across many stories simultaneously. The fireproofing that was supposed to protect the steel had also been blasted off by the impacts, leaving the structure exposed. This meant the fires didn't have to melt the steel. They only had to heat it enough, around 600 degrees Celsius, to weaken it. The floor trusses, those long spans of lightweight steel that connected the outer walls to the inner core, began to sag under the heat. And as they gave way, they pulled the exterior columns inward, weakening the structure even further. Once the damaged floors could no longer hold, the upper sections of the towers began to drop. And when that happened, the weight was overwhelming. Each falling floor slammed into the one below, adding its load, and the collapse became an unstoppable chain reaction. Floor after floor gave way in rapid succession. So it wasn't the explosion alone, or just the fires, or only the damaged structure that caused the collapse. It was all of those and gravity acting together in a way the tower's designers had never anticipated that brought the buildings down. By the evening of September 11th, the skyline of New York had been permanently altered. The Twin Towers were gone, and with them thousands of lives. In total, 2,977 people were killed in the attacks that day. Office workers, airline passengers, and crew firefighters, police officers, and first responders who had rushed toward danger. The World Trade Center complex lay in ruins, reduced to smoke, twisted steel, and mountains of debris. For weeks, fires smoldered in the wreckage. It would take eight months to remove all the debris and clear the site. A site that was renamed Ground Zero, a place of grief and shock but also of questions. Could Lower Manhattan ever recover? Should anything be built here again? And if so, what? These questions would shape the next chapter of the site's history and of the next episode of our series. In the next episode, we'll look at the long and difficult process of rebuilding Ground Zero, the debates, the competitions, the architects, and the designs that tried, each in their own way, to fill the void left behind. If you've made it this far, thank you. This was not an easy story to tell, but whether we like it or not, it is part of modern architectural history. A story that shaped the way we think about cities, towers, and resilience and one that we need to understand before moving into the next chapter of this series. In the next episode, we'll focus on the process of rebuilding Ground Zero. From national ambition to political tension, from architectural competitions to symbolism, and the architects who suddenly found themselves facing the chance to design on a site nobody ever thought would need to be built on again. I'm Liam Karen, and I'll see you next week. Until then, Keep looking up.